I'm here in the ABCT and I'm here with an old friend who is Thomas Borkovic. Um, he's a very generous man because uh, it's a long time that he has relationships all, all around the world with people who are interested in uh, his research on worry and on interpersonal therapy and on his thoughts and opinions about our world, our, our cognitive world. And so I have four questions for you. Um, the first one is this. First thing is very technical for you. Where is now the research on worry? Mm. It is very... Well, there's a, a growing group of young investigators uh, coming out of uh, not just my lab, but uh, the former lab of Andrew Matthews uh, that are pursuing uh, the processes and functions of worry. Uh, making use of uh, cognitive and neuroscience approaches to better understand what worry is all about, uh, how it functions in our daily lives, and how it functions transdiagnostically across many of the disorders. Uh, very exciting new results coming out, uh, including Emily Holmes' research uh, having to do with the role of thinking versus imagery, which has been very, very important to us. Uh, the symposia that I've been to uh, at the conference this week uh, are elaborating more and more about what human thinking is all about. The crown of creation, our ability to conceptualize, to plan, to think, to time bind between the future and the past, and how all these processes interact with one another in adaptive ways, but also it can, it can be transformed into very maladaptive ways of being. And uh, so I think this is uh, interesting, and it's a development in, uh, of, of your previous concept of worry. So we know many things more, not only in psychopathology, but in how it is uh, construed, this concept. Uh, another question. Uh, now, in EABCT, there, there is a big way of compassion, acceptance, uh, mindfulness, uh, metacognitions, and I want to have your opinion about this big wave that we see. Well, uh, one thing it reflects, is, of course, is that uh, our field is constantly evolving with new ideas coming uh, from many different directions, though the, I think the most important direction is from empirical science that we are investigating the phenomenon scientifically and experimentally. Um, actually, many of my Buddhist friends think I'm a Buddhist, for example, if we talk about mindfulness. Uh, and, uh, and it's because that my own research and logical deductions from that research on worry uh, leads to the conclusion that it might be very adaptive for us to spend less time up in our heads and more time paying attention to what is real, to what's right in front of us, uh, external reality. Uh, all these systems, cognitive, affective, behavioral, evolve to process information and come up with adaptive responses. So if we would just pay attention to our world and allow those systems to process all the available information that's in that world moment to moment, uh, then I think we can find greater joy and happiness, uh, we can learn and grow, uh, and we can minimize the likelihood of anxiety and depression. There can be no anxiety or depression in the present moment. If I'm focused on what's real right in front of me, I can't be anxious or depressed. If I am anxious or depressed in a present moment, then it's because my mind is somewhere in the future or somewhere in the past. So. My own data lead me to the conclusion that uh, living in the present moment is the opposite of many of the non-adaptive processes involved in emotional disorders. Now, the mindfulness tradition tends to come from the uh, Eastern points of view, uh, uh, and, and so that's fine. We can draw in ideas from anywhere as long, yes, as long as we experimentally evaluate uh, the deductions and hypotheses that come from any tradition because we are in empirical science. Uh, but it's interesting to me that very different traditions, the scientific tradition and Eastern philosophy, lead to the same place. 
when I ask my mindfulness friends, what is the purpose of mindfulness? They say, to live in the present moment. And I say, why don't you go right there? You don't need meditation practices necessarily. That may be one path to getting there. But we have lots of cognitive research now that shows that computer programs can help us in steering our attention to this or to that, away from this or away from that. And so why not develop programs that will help us to learn to focus on external reality, to go right to the present moment. And this is the way we work with our GAD clients. Uh, but uh, how do they answer to you? Uh, well, they say, yes, that's a very good idea, Tom, but we're going to work on evolving uh, so our meditation <laughs> Defending techniques. the area. Sure, and that makes sense. And I think for anyone, they need to go deeply into their phenomena. And so, uh, hopefully, the mindfulness people go, will go deeply into mindfulness from uh, an empirical point of view to do scientific research on mindfulness, and that indeed is happening. Mm. Uh, so that's a good sign. Uh, uh, the interesting thing that uh, before coming here, I asked Tom, I have four questions. You want to know them, and he said, no. We'll see. <laughs> it is the surprise <laughs> is better than suspense. <laughs> okay, and now let's arrive to the Congress. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the third question is, what do you think about this Geneva Congress? Uh, give me an opinion about the atmosphere, or if you found something interesting happens that you want to tell us. Well, I think it's been a very good conference. Uh, I've been to several of the paper sessions, and they've been very high quality. The uh, Keynote speakers, for example, have done excellent jobs in giving overviews of their areas and stimulating new ideas. But I'm especially encouraged, as I said before, about the young people who have been presenting. They are idealistic, and hopefully they can hold on to that idealism, the quest for truth in the work that they're doing. Uh, and they're doing uh, very rigorous research in helping us to understand the nature, the functions, the origins. Uh, of psychological problems uh, as a foundation upon which to build uh, new therapy interventions. Uh, so in general, it's been very, very exciting. The, to me, personally, the most exciting areas have been the work in imagery. So imagery is coming back ever since the days of Joe Wolpe and systematic desensitization, exactly. making use of imagery exposure techniques. Uh, for a while, imagery was lost. Uh, but now I see it coming back because the basic research is showing its power and its multiple functions and how it can be used with clients in a healing way. See, uh, I had the same sensation and I, I had the sensation that uh, a generation, generation of old uh, cognitive therapies is missing. Mm -hmm. And so there are many new names and many uh, new ideas around. I had the same yeah. sensation you had. And uh, Tom, uh, you made a keynote uh, that was how will be CBT in 30 years? And now you can try to summarize in, uh, you have two seconds now, I give you more time. Well, I, I, I have fun playing with the idea of evolution. What are the possibilities for mm -hmm. human beings? Uh, because it, it, even though it's many millennia from now that we would see mm -hmm. with our own human eyes, the effects of further evolution, uh, I think it's fun to, to think about what the possibilities might be, because that might give us ideas in the present about what kinds of ideas to pursue. Uh, and so if I look way out into the future, 30,000 years from now, what I see <coughs> is uh, that we have learned to let go of our beliefs, or at least be aware of what those beliefs that we have but are constantly allowing those beliefs to be modified by experience, by processing reality accurately. So the essence of future cognitive therapy will be to help people to process reality in a better way. But in that 30,000 years from now, I think the end, one of the steps we get to is that we'll begin to see how everything is connected to everything else. And that even space and time are irrelevant. A, a world in which everything is intimately familiar 
but completely novel at the same time, where there's increased freedom of choice, lessened determinism, mm -hmm. lessened habit, lessened lack of awareness, greater awareness of being able to see the pattern in the midst of the apparent chaos, and then to live in the pattern in the midst of the apparent chaos. Ultimately, that leads to from uh, determinism with growing choice, growing freedom, to eventually freedom with a little bit of determinism. <laughs> Less rigidity. Absolutely. Flexibility. Uh, so you see that you think that CBT is widening uh, yes. his future yes. be, because many things are coming inside uh, in, in this theory and in this therapy from mm -hmm. other worlds and yes. it is uh, becoming more integrative. Yes. From our very beginnings in early behavior therapy, which should never be forgotten, um, we committed ourselves to understanding psychopathology and developing treatment techniques for psychopathology based on the best known laws of behavior, empirically determined. So we continue to ground everything that we do in cause and effect relationships. Mm -hmm. So anytime we find a cause and effect relationship, we can integrate that into our therapies. So if emotional avoidance is part of a person's problem, then we need graduated exposure to emotion in order to remove the fear of emotion so the individual can make use of the evolutionary value of emotion to motivate and direct adaptive behavior. Thus we're going to draw in gestalt techniques as causes, as techniques that cause emotional change. The important thing is that, is that we identify causes of interventions irrespective of what theoretical framework or school of psychotherapy it came. So eventually CBT will be called Cognitive Behavioral Affective Imaginal Interpersonal Attentional Physiological Therapy. Or we could, can call it POINT. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. Right. Yes. Because we will, be only, we will be making only use of techniques that empirically have been demonstrated to cause change within the human system. So you are saying that the two other important things. One thing is the cause-effect, mm -hmm. maintaining this attitude, and the second is to be very wide in discovering new ideas, but basing them on empirical study. Yes, exactly. That was the original commitment of early behavior therapy. So, and this is it just happened at the time, in the 40s and 50s, that operant and classical conditioning were the best known laws of behavior. True. And they gave birth to the vast majority of empirically supported treatments that we have today. True. So we need to continue this our empirical pursuit, our basic science approach to determine more laws of cognition, emotion, and behavior from which to draw in developing therapy techniques. Okay. I think it's it, uh, Tom. It was a very interesting speech. I oh, hope you, you enjoyed it. Oh, I love it. <laughs> and I hope to see you again in the Marrakesh. Ah, I will see you there. Uh -huh.